I guess we're clicking there. All right. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, this is another perspective uh, where I do twice weekly. We talk about some of the uh, issues that I believe are important. Um, sometimes they are, they're so-so, sometimes they're not, and sometimes we, we – well, this one's a big one. This is weather, this is climate, and this is why I'm, I'm not on TV right now is because simply of this, of this topic. I came across some information, and uh, there was a narrative in place, and I began to question it, and that was, uh, that was going to be the end of the professional part of my career. So, uh, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to walk away from those things when you, uh, your services aren't, aren't needed. But weather is so important. Climate is so, so important because without it, we don't eat. Everything survives. Everything lives. Everything dies or it thrives depending on the health of weather, of the climate, of the environment. We could go underground. We could uh, create you know, greenhouses underground and controlled uh, <clears throat> food and growing environments uh, like you saw on um, – that may, Matt Damon movie where they went to Mars, where it, that was it. The, the mission succeeded on, on the greenhouses or it failed utterly, depending on food. And that's almost uh, where we are right now. So I, I, I kind of want to get into this. I you know assembled a bunch of, of data. And as I put the show together, I realized that, oh, my God, there's no way. There is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to get to it all. Uh, it, it truly is just going to be a fraction of it because the story is so broad, so deep, and there's so much, there's so much depth to it that maybe this is why it isn't an election issue, that it is a, a protesting issue that has been reduced to somebody's cards and, and somebody's sign that they, they walk around with uh, because the issue is, is complex. It crosses all aspects of life. And to truly change it, you can see why... Uh, the Green New Deal was going to cost trillions of dollars because its impact across the economy is that great. It is totally that great. And how we, how we uh, address this, not in our kids' lifetimes, but in the next decade. In the next decade. And, and I, I've been kind of a part of, a, of the anti just because I come from and have recognized other aspects going out of the sky, that the story that the government tells us isn't necessarily the whole story. But there's, uh, there are solutions to this that are much, much cheaper than just that. So let's come over here and begin this. Uh, I have to play back part of, um, part of what we were doing last week. And maybe I can get this to share. Maybe it won't. Maybe let's, let's start here. Yes. Application window. There we are. And let's go to it. All right, is the climate crisis one of heat or cold? That's the question. And um, the agenda is for warming. That honestly is the comfortable answer. If the climate is changing and we're getting warming, that, that's okay. Then we're not going to freeze to death. Then we can build sloppily you know, our, our homes and our structures. Uh, if, the, if the planet warms, then maybe the sea levels come up a little bit. But the oceans are 70% of this planet. They may expand a little bit, but if we can't, you know, move our buildings to 10 foot above sea level, then there's really something wrong with where we built, and that needs to be assessed. So uh, over here real quick, I, I just listened to you about the 130 degrees in Death Valley, and, and last week's one is too good. Facebook, we need to talk. Uh, we need presidential debates during the election. As I step back from the news floor the past week, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's true. We do need that debate, and I'm going to hit that a little bit harder today. So the climate crisis is one of heat or cold. However, I'm going to go back to last my last show I did on Wednesday where we talked about food and food security, and these two topics are, are deeply interrelated. So we'll, we'll hit that, and we talked about China. We talked about flooding. We talked about their drought in the northwest part of the country. And we also talked about the heavy rains and the huge impacts that those rains have had on that, cl on, on that country. And then we threw out their flood. Uh, you know, uh, will there be a famine? Is that an eventuality? Well, where we are is into the second week of China's clean plate program against food waste. And China's probably not that much different than the United States, where they're becoming a first world country. They've had the incomes to where food becomes relatively cheap meal by meal by meal for the middle income and certainly so for the upper income. But this also comes after weeks of mass flooding across southern China, which has left, left farms wrecked and ruins 
untold tons of produce. So the state news agency, the Global Times, sought to downplay what it called the media hype that China was heading for a food crisis. Yes, because you don't want people to panic. So state TV also criticized live streamers who filmed themselves eating large amounts of food. Don't be stupid about it, guys. You might need this in a month. So we're worse with food waste than we than we than we think. So what they've tried to do is implementing a system where groups must order one dish less than the number of diners. The system is called N-1 or N-1. So a group of 10 people can only order nine dishes. But it's likely the system will take some time to get adjusted to in a country where it is seen as polite to order more than the amount needed. We're not that different here. But in a group setting, empty plates are sometimes seen as a sign of a bad host. I can understand that, signifying that an insufficient number amount of food was ordered for the guests. So what if one person goes to the restaurant alone? How many dishes could he order? Zero, asked one person in a microblogging site. So this is kind of what, what they're doing, is recognizing that there is food waste. And if you can also recognize that there is less food upstream in the silos, in the warehouses, in the corrals, in the pens, than what we're going to need in a set amount of time, then you've got to immediately begin to condition people to not waste. And nobody, I can't say nobody, but I was always uncomfortable wasting, waste with wasting food. And it was something that we had to do was to not waste food. Uh, with seven of us kids, if there were leftovers after mom made the main course and we all got our single serving, if there was leftovers, I had my hand up. I was, you know, I'll take more, please, mom. So we're kind of in that place with China, recognizing that we've got some food issues coming down the pike. And then let's throw this in. So I'm going to start with global warming because chronologically that's where it happened. I kind of wanted to go back into the Maurice Strong issue who whose wife actually lives in the community that I'm in in Colorado. And Marie Strong arguably was the grandfather of global warming. He was the one through his position in the UN and with the One Earth program who began to campaign, began to get this concept out there that we need a fewer people. And if the way we're living is going to continue the way it's been, then He's probably not wrong with that. It's just how do you get there? So he was in, in many, un, in almost no uncertain terms, the grandfather of global warming. And that's curious because you would think if this is a scientific thing, that it would be the sun or the source of, of the global warming would be the grandfather of global warming, not a UN globalist. So right there in my eyes, the scientist's eyes, we have a disconnect. So I'm going to go back to when I began on TV. The global story warming was just taking hold as I took my first on-air job in 1988. Back then, I was a wet-behind-the-ears meteorology student from the University of Kansas that trusted the education system, the government, and yeah, even NASA. I had telescopes. I loved space, so I definitely trusted NASA. If they all agreed that the planet was warming, then who was I to argue? It was also the year that changes were occurring in how weather data was collected. Up until then, we had an observer go out at 50, between 50 minutes after the hour to 56 minutes after the hour and go out to the instrument cluster, read the data, sling the hygrometer, take the humidity, look at the sky, write it down, and then teletype it out to the system. And then the data was all disseminated and then resent out to we users. It was 1988 that computers took over that job. So, and that was called the Automated Surface Observing System. Computers. All right. This is the year that changes were occurring in how weather data was collected and then was disseminated to the users. And I, as an end user, was introduced to ASOS. The computer became the new official weather observer. It was that summer, the summer of 1988. I was in Topeka, Kansas at the time, and it was on fire. And that heat wave was amazing nationwide. Global warming was here and I was a believer. I grew up in eastern Idaho, so Yellowstone was within our television's ADI, our area of dominant influence. I can see the cameras dropped. That's just crazy how that happens. So I was, we were in that ADI, and so it was, it was big news, but I was removed. I had just I was still in college at, in 88 and, and on the air, but hearing stories about Yellowstone, and these fires just kept going. 
And if this is what global warming was going to do to these especially beautiful forests that were in my backyard, I would do my part to spread the world that we needed new renewable sources of energy. It only made sense. It was just common sense. And in the wake of the fires, we got to September and October, and you looked at what happened to Yellowstone. Nearly a third of that national park was burned. Now, we had been fighting fires aggressively for decades. And so the buildup, the firewood load was intense. And without man, the thing would have burned and it would have created a fire break from one side where the fire didn't touch to the other. And we're dealing with that in Colorado now. Even as I look out across the San Luis Valley, it is hazy, it is smoky because we have major fires underway. So after that summer of 88, I was a good soldier for the cause. I spoke to many, many classes about whether my job, television, and of course the greatest challenge ahead of us, uh, global warming. Oil and pollution is the bad guy. And if we could just end our dependence on oil, all would end well. All would end well. But how would we get there? And then a funny thing happened as I was researching energy. For some reason inside of me, I always knew that there was a, that there was an energy crisis coming. And honestly, that's what was driving me into the zones of research that I eventually ended up into was was energy. So a funny thing happened as I was researching this in 1999. I had discovered free energy, Nikola Tesla, and thank you, the Internet, at that point in time. And energy from the vacuum, as another physicist called it, that Nikola Tesla had already a century ago solved the world's energy problems that were now being blamed on a scarce, an unreliable resource, a polluting resource, an expensive resource called oil, and that the burning of this oil was causing our weather problems. So which scenario is right? If we have had for a century solutions to an energy problem and are still tormenting ourselves, tormenting the population over oil, then what's the problem? So I asked myself, if we are to have these solutions to our energy and climate problems, why aren't we or haven't we retooled the global economy to leverage this clean, limitless, distributed solution? And then who would benefit from the secrecy? And in some ways, this green movement is a gift because it's pressing the issue. But what they're not seeing is that the solution has been in front of us for decades. It's a cheap, cheap solution. A cheap solution rather than solar and wind. You put up solar and wind to do that in Western Canada and they deal with clouds in December, in January. You end up under an Arctic high pressure. The wind is nearly still. The nighttime lows are minus 40 Celsius. There isn't enough energy in the grid to support a small community, let alone towns like Edmonton or Alberta, Alberta or, or Lethbridge or, or Whitehorse. It just isn't possible. And so this is a red herring of the first order. So what I came across was this man's information, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Bearden. He was Army Intelligence. And inside this cup, this space is, is enough energy to boil all of the oceans of the world. This is a fact and well known to the scientific community and was, for example, a favorite quote of Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. The two Nobel Prizes were awarded in 1957 to Lee and Yang for substantiating the extraction process for this energy. And so the old archaic uh, electrical engineering model was formed in the 1880s and 1890s. And modern physics to this day remains anchored in this 130-year-old paradigm, even though now we've moved into general relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics, uh, gauge field theory, quantum field theory, and particle physics has been born and developed since. Physics has made a century of product, uh, progress since the old EE model was frozen in 1892. Modern physics assures us that the vacuum space-time energy or space-time continuum has enormous energy and that it continually interacts with every charge in the circuit in a system in the universe, continually exchanging enormous even mind-boggling energy with it and indeed those forces of all of our systems are produced by this interaction so how do we get this energy how do we change our systems so that we can tap this power so how did this relate to weather how did this relate to where i was i would see on the radar screens flashes flashes and it was Colonel Bearden's assertion that this technology had been used by 
forces. Maybe they weren't American or national forces, but outside forces that were impacting the atmosphere. And that was that was potentially, uh, I mean, mind boggling for for me as a weatherman. So he, he, I started with, with radar rings. And then as I got a little more known in this community, I ended up with, with pictures, people sending shots to me of things, of resonance patterns in the skies, in the clouds that are just not natural. Remember, in meteorology, to get through school, you've got to study fluid dynamics. If you look at a stream of the ocean, you're dealing with fluid dynamic, but you're also looking at waves impacting on top. And those waves are are formed by interactions of forces, by islands, by coastlines, by mounds below. Those things cause a reaction, a bounce back, some kind of a wave. And so as, as we moved into 2005, I began to also see this technology slowly leaking into the public's consciousness. How can you have lasers, truly coherent lasers, being able to come from some platform above the clouds through the clouds and then landing in the ocean so we're dealing with some kind of technology that quite frankly is amazing but we're still dealing with this global warming issue because i'm still on the news and still going to schools but i can't talk about this other aspect of free energy that could be being used in front of our eyes so i continued to tell this tale that goes down something like this the co2 an invisible gas gets into the atmosphere and by natural forms by humans burning hydrocarbons. In fact, more CO2 is created by nature and the planet than by all of the petroleum we're burning today. Imagine that. And this CO2 then establishes a layer of reflection that bounces the heat back to the Earth's surface. This story is presented to us as being the greenhouse effect. Now, if we look at the actual potential of carbon dioxide, it rates as the lowest number on the scale of a one. Methane 20 times, 25 times more powerful, and the nitrous oxide is nearly off the charts at nearly 300. But we still have this issue of CO2 climbing, and you can see this zigzag type of pattern. There's far more land in the northern hemisphere, and when it greens, it begins the plants, you know, the leaves come out, the plants grow, the weeds come up, and they sequester carbon dioxide. It is their oxygen to you and I. It's their nutrients. If you take the, the CO2 level down below about 200, maybe even 250, then the whole of the planet kingdom, the plant kingdom just begins to, to wither away. So that's what's happening with, with the carbon dioxide. There's just been this, this relentless march upward. This only goes back to 1960, so barely 60 years. And we're crossing probably about 420 where we are right now. But if we look back through time, we can see that we are way low on this scale, that at times millions, even hundreds of millions of years ago, that CO2 was 10, 20 times higher than it is today. And that at each peak, there's a drop off. At each peak, there's an extinction level event and it drops off. So something breaks the plant animal cycle that re results in CO2 crashing down. Is that related with temperature? And it pretty much, you know, undoubtedly ultimately is. And if we look at these temperature cycles going back just one half of a processional cycle, this is the last 10,000 years, and one trip around a, the uh, one processional cycle is 26,000 years. So this isn't even quite half of that. You can see after every peak, there is an abrupt and rapid drop. So whatever triggers the peak can only go so far before something cyclically turns on itself, the cycles revert, and then it begins to drop off. And where we have been for nearly the last 800 years is cool, very, very cool. So we've had this little bit of a warming, about a half a degree Celsius or about eight tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. This is, this is the objective. This isn't homogenized data. This isn't adjusted data. This is just straight ice core readings. And granted, Greenland represents just the northern hemisphere, but we have that core data for the southern hemisphere. So back to the headline. Highest temperature on Earth is Death Valley, U.S. hits 54.4 degrees Celsius. This is less than a day ago. So that is, a, that is 130 degrees, which had broken, if I'm not mistaken, the old record by about 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, 
that's not insignificant. However, so what could be the highest temperature ever reliably recorded on Earth? 130 Fahrenheit may have been reached in Death Valley, California. The reading is still being verified by the U.S. National Weather Service, and it comes amid a heat wave along the West Coast, where temperatures are, are forecast to be just as warm as they have been. It says warmer. We'll see what happens. So uh, before this, the highest temperature reliably recorded on Earth was 129.2, or 54 Celsius, also back in Death Valley in 2013. A higher reading of 134, and this is the one that's been in the record books for such a long time, or 56.6 Celsius a century earlier, I believe it was 1913, uh, also in Death Valley, is disputed. It is believed by some modern weather observers to have been erroneous, along with several other searing temperatures recorded that particular summer. So the heat wave goes on, and according to a 2016 analysis from histo weather historian Christopher Burt, other temperatures in the region recorded in 1913 just do not corroborate the Death Valley reading. And then we have issues with, with instrumentation. Back then, it was gla uh, alcoholic glass thermometers, and there's nothing wrong with those. And indeed, the weather station in Death Valley had been the old, same as it ever was, of a glass alcohol thermometer uh, inside a white box until about 1999. And then they went to the new ASOS, the new electrical system, uh, where you know you can see see the reading, the digital reading inside your observing station or inside the airport. Most of, most of these are all at airports now. And then we we converted we went back and maybe you know there's still some some question as to whether they were angling for this record temperature by going into older readings but then another record for the planet 131 was recorded in tanzania in 1931 but uh, mr burt said this reading as well as others recorded in africa during the colonial era had serious credibility issues so the heat wave goes on today is just monday today's monday so we'll see what happens tomorrow and so how did I? Yeah, let's just go here because I, I we're close on time. So we have this global warming. And another in-between aspect that I didn't get into was the sighting of, of weather stations. And because all of this global warming discussion and how much we've warmed, so much of it can be attributed to where we're actually putting the weather stations. We're putting them at airports. We're putting them in cities. We're putting them by pavements and, and buildings and, and air conditioning vents. Uh, we're putting them near parking lots. We're putting them on top of the buildings. So what had been a very, very strict, regimented protocol for where we site these weather stations has been completely thrown away. And that alone is responsible for nearly 2 degrees Celsius or 3.8, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit of the warming. It's just bad data. And across the United States, 80 plus percent, the number is closer to 86, and this was only up into 2012. We're still doing research where there's a team of people that goes out and checks on these these uh, installations to see if they were done correctly, if they were done to standard. You know, what, what would be the point of you taking a thermometer, putting it in your mouth or reading it on your forehead if the sensor inside was already biased three degrees warm? So you, you hit your forehead, it reads 101.5 when your internal temperature should be 98.6. You would say, I have a low-grade fever. You're sick. And if we're doing this with the planet, with these sighted weather stations that are biased, two to three degrees out of the gate, then they're already biased and saying the planet of the climate system is sick. So if you're bringing in this bad data, running it through these climate models, then there is a quote, uh, there, uh, there's a term, it's called garbage in, garbage out. And that's kind of where we are. So Dr. Ju Dr. Judith Curry, and she has promised me, I promise she has taken a lot of grief. Dr. Judith Curry is a performer and pro former chair of School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Institute of Technology. She used to be on, on board with the anthropogenic global warming agenda, but after November 2009 ClimateGate scandal, that's a whole nother show where there's a trove of emails that was released between these different institutes. Most of them, if not all of them, receiving government money to do the climate research. And they were, at, even at 2009, how to hide the decline in temperature. How do we adjust the 1930s or the 1950s or the more medieval warm period? How do we make that data look colder so that it looks warmer today? So if you can play with the data before you release a press release, before you get published, if you massage the data, 
you know, who, who would want to have an accountant that can massage your data? Because at some point in time, you're going to go you write a check on that account that you believe has more in it than it does, and it doesn't clear. So this is, this is the thing, and this is the curiousness with science. You know, if you could buy politicians, who says you can't buy scientists? And that's kind of where she ended up re- uh, realizing there, there, was, there were problems. So no one questions that surface temperatures have increased since 1880, as we just came out of the last deep cold spell. However, there's considerable uncertainty and disagreement about the most consequential issues, whether the warming has been dominated by human causes versus natural variability, and how much the planet will warm in the 21st century. We've been misled in our quest to understand climate change by not paying sufficient attention to natural causes of climate variability. And if we begin to look at the sun, if we begin to look at oscillations in the ocean currents, we will begin to see and understand where we are in this great cycle. And it takes a brave person, a very brave person to come forward and, and address these issues. And they more often than not, as we're seeing with doctors and nurses these day that, days that tell the truth about the current medical issues, they lose their employment. There is a cost for these people to pay to tell the truth. And that is what is most unfortunate in my eyes. So a poll of American results in the last, this was two years ago, how likely is it that some scientists have falsified global warming research? And there's your scale. So between somewhat or very likely, we're at two thirds, even though consensus tells us that 97% of the scientists have agreed. Thing is, there's a large contingent of those science upwards of 75% that are not even in the climatology or meteorology fields of business. They're physicists. They're, uh, they're this, they're that. They're, they're, they're medical scientists. And then they're being asked to opine on the relevance of global warming. And this, I just came across across one of those stories. So I'm like, yes, this is it. Um, you know, you want to help the environment. And the elephant in the room is geoengineering. Because just look at the, the trails in the sky that smear on out and become cloud cover. If we're truly to know what is happening with the planet, we have got to sight, meaning locate, our thermometers and these weather stations in appropriate locations. Therefore, to properly understand where the climate is, we need to know what man, what these aircraft are doing with cloud cover, because this is not natural. And as we saw in the three days after 9-11, where air traffic was stopped, a full stop across the United States, the distance between the low temperature in the morning and that afternoon high temperature widened by three degrees Fahrenheit. And the transparency of the atmosphere cleared up amazingly. So we have the global warming protesters, strikers, whatever you want to call them, those that are aware of this and, and are vocal about it, you know, talking about carbon. This isn't, well, it is and it isn't carbon, but most likely it's, it's just water vapor and the other, other materials that are in there, the oxides, the nitrates, the iodides of silver, aluminum, barium, strontium, and other elements that we find in the water samples. That's out there. You're breathing it and you've got nanoparticles in your system from this. But it's this cloud cover and the engineering that is playing with the weather. And if you don't know what's happening with that, then how can you know what's happening with the climate? We don't have a baseline to understand where we truly are unless you're highly briefed, highly classified, and a part of these operations. So back to Yellowstone. So this past summer, this was uh, 2018, was the 30th anniversary of those Yellowstone fires. Massive blazes that affect 1.2 million acres in and around Yellowstone Park. Their size and severity surprised scientists, managers, and the public, and it obviously received heavy media coverage. Many news reports proclaimed that Yellowstone was destroyed, but nothing was further from the truth. I was there during the fires and returned that fall to view the aftermath. Burned forests extended for miles with blackened tree trunks creating a stark and seemingly desolate landscape. That peering down from a helicopter, we were surprised to see that the fires had actually produced a mosaic of burned and unburned patches of forest. And because Yellowstone's forests were remarkably resilient, the 88 fires were not an ecological catastrophe. Today, however, climate and fire trends may be pushing forests beyond their limits. The rules of the game are changing fast. And the upside with the Yellowstone fires was that it happened in 88. 
where Colorado is today and the amount of wood and timber. Utah and Wyoming likely the same and maybe even now parts of Yellowstone and central Idaho because of the timber and we're 30 years farther down the road because we haven't had appropriate fires to clean things out. So since the fires and because the CO2 continues to climb step by step by step, year after year after year, more and more of it in the atmosphere as I'm breathing, as I'm talking to you, it is coming out of my breath. It's coming off the skin. More and more CO2 goes in. So am I a pollutant or am I just nourishing the plants that are just outside the front and back doors? The nourishing the plants that are in, in the front room of the house. Are they soaking this up? So a from a quarter to half of the Earth's, ve Earth's vegetated lands have shown significant greening over the last 35 years, largely due to the rising levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide. This according to a new study published in the journal Nature, uh, in Nature Climate Change on, on April 25. So we're recognizing that CO2 does have its side benefits because it is crucial to the life cycle of plants. And that is the beauty of it. And especially in places like that, that cusp right where the desertification begins to turn into jungle in central and northern Africa, in central Africa, where that, that explosive plant growth, you throw a little water on it and it just grows. So how do we solve this issue? How do we recognize what is the new problem? What are we facing in the years ahead? Do we go back and do we examine the sun? Do we look at solar cycles and recognize the Dalton minimum back in the late 1700s resulted in very chilly temperatures, localized famine in Europe and the States because of a solar minimum? Another period, remember the temperatures increasing from 1880, Dr. Uh, Judith Curry's slide about five slides back, at the end of the Little Ice Age, right there at that same time period. And if you look at those charts, hey, look, see the planet warming. They'll go back to 1880 and chart it from there, from the bottom of the last cool period. But we're now entering one of those cool periods. So can that CO2, can that invisible gas that is such a simple molecule of CO2 actually compensate for what is happening with the sun as it goes deeper and deeper? and deeper into sleep, resulting in less energy on the planet. So as we wind this up, in an election year, would you believe, maybe even consider, hope, and trust that these issues could be addressed as adults and as mature human beings? We can solve our energy issues. We've got limitless power. All we have to do is be able to pry it out from those that have kept it secret for so long. And if we can do that, we will have the energy because we won't be needing to pollute, to propulse ourselves, to drive our cars. And that's kind of the cool thing about the electrification of vehicles is that it is laying a groundwork for this distributed power, this new electrics to begin to come onto the scene. And I trust that the next president, whoever it is, might have the courage to push us forward to play a game of chicken with those that want to keep petroleum as the only source. And in my eyes, that is the leverage of the green movement right now that they have. If they could just see that this other technology exists, then demands for it would grow into a global chorus because then we could shut down opening the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge into oil exploration. That is criminal. In my eyes, that's just criminal for us to do any kind of exploration when we have this technology literally in the back pockets. And once we do address that energy issue, which is where I started jumping down this rabbit hole, we can address correctly our weather and climate expectations. And when we can take oil out of the mix, when we can take the green movement out of the mix, then we can apolitically look at climate and weather and maybe even the technologies that I believe that I see in the sky that are at work. That is in the wake of World War II, the White House's department or agency or, or project on weather modification can come forward. And we can turn this planet not into a battleground, but something far more peaceful and productive. But will we and can we? And we've had these solutions right in front of our eyes for decades, but greed and the incessant need to control have kept humanity in slavery. 
And I'm hoping that we can answer the question that is the true crisis truly one of the climate or is it something else? All right, guys, good to see you kind of over there uh, talking in there. I know you've been chatting it up and um, I, this is a deep issue and this is this is my big boy. This is my big boy. And I trust that uh, uh, the green movement will have its place into it. The, the chemtrail a- activists have their place in it because they're seeing a part of it. Uh, that the uh, the free energy guys have a part in it, that we can all come together on this and really leave the future for the children, heck for ourselves, because we're all not that old. Like, so much progress can be done in two terms, in eight years. Eight years, we could make so much headway on these issues if we just had a clear direction and clear goals as to where we as individuals as a, as a city, as a nation, and as a people uh, wanted to go. All right, thanks for coming on in there. Uh, good to see you over there, Vicki. Uh, Ron Newcomer, Awful Chemtrails in California. Yeah, that was, that was crazy what was happening in there today uh, with that strong high pressure this afternoon sitting over Utah and had them rolling over here. And, you know, they really like to work in areas of high pressure. It's the stillest uh, location, you know, there, there's purposes. It's just so they can they can engineer and manage the weather. And I'd really like to see another couple of whistleblowers come forward and share with us uh, what they know, because it would put some pieces together of how it all works. All right, guys, thanks for stopping in. Um, we'll see what we hit on uh, on Wednesday. I'm not quite sure. There's so much there's so much else in this that I, I you know, I, I assemble all the information. And then as I throw it into the, into the slideshow, I try to try to come up with the proper narrative. But as uh, as I got closer to showtime, I just realized that I can't go here. I don't have time for this. I can't do this. Uh, let's just kind of hit these big themes and we'll, we'll hit citing. Uh, the geoengineering part is big because once you see the pictures and once you understand what's happening, you'll wonder, you know, why doesn't everyone see it? And as I first jumped in this in 2004 and 5, I thought at 10 years most, 10 years most, it would just be understood because once you see the patterns and, and what should and shouldn't happen up there, uh, that uh, it couldn't be denied, especially by those who claim to know what's happening weatherwise. All right, Steve, uh, hey, thanks for coming in there. And Tracy, uh, your perspective, uh, and Subo, great show. You, I know we can come together. I know we can. It's just our nature. It's our nature to want to cooperate, to accomplish. It just feels good. And, you know, and the, and the soul, the poor, core part of us just wants to give. And we give by sharing. And it's we share all of our parts together and, and, and our, our, our skills. I know that um, I know that this can be done before before I have to check out of here. All right, guys, I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a great night.